So maybe God is just writing this about himself, trying to make a good name. Or maybe he's telling Moses to say this. But it isn't God speaking. And it isn't his servant, Moses. If you read that chapter, this is from Balaam. And if you do not know who Balaam is, he's a sorcerer, a diviner, a worshiper of other gods. He was called in by a foreign king to place a curse upon the nation of Israel as they were wandering through the wilderness. He tried on three different occasions to curse the people. But God would not allow it. Instead, blessings came forth. No matter how hard Balaam tried to curse, he could not. While trying to explain to the king why he could not, he came and told us that very statement. Does he, God, speak and did not act? Does he promise and not fulfill? Just hearing it and realizing who it comes from is a strong testimony in and of itself of the strength of the promises of God. It came from the very lips of a man who knew not our God. While hearing this from Balaam is wonderful news, hearing it about Christ is awesome. The Apostle Paul wanted to reassure the Corinthian church of this. And that is where our first passage came from this morning. In the first chapter of 2 Corinthians, we read the following. For no matter how many promises God has made, they are yes in Christ. And so through him, the Amen is spoken by us to the glory of God. Yes. Now it is God who makes both us and you stand firm in Christ. He anointed us, set his seal of ownership on us, and put his very spirit in our hearts as a deposit, guaranteeing what is to come. At Calvary, God purchased you through the death of his son. Because of who Jesus is and his ministry of reconciliation, everything that God had originally intended for us, he will now see through. Why should we doubt him? He did have to pay a high price for us. That high price was the very life of his son, Jesus Christ. And if God was willing willing to pay such a high price to acquire us. Will he so quickly discard us? Or let us be tarnished? To fall to the wayside? To be bruised? No. God, because he sees great value in us, wants to take this rough gem of, of what we are perfect it, make it all that it can be, to bring out our full brightness, color, clarity, and value. His Son, Jesus Christ, affirms that. Jesus sent the Holy Spirit to even validate us by putting that Holy Spirit within us to show that we are of value, that we are a prized possession of God. God, therefore, is working on you. Jesus bought you, and the Spirit guarantees what God is going to do with you. But if we have all these promises, as we start this morning, why is life so draining? Why is it so difficult? Why is it so hard? If God, the Creator, of all and second to none values us, purchases us, and is doing all this to prove us, why do we struggle? Why do we feel weak and impoverished? Why is life so hard when we want to give up? 
There are several different answers, but the one which I want to focus on this morning is the difference comes down to wanting to be what God wants us to be and what is present. We hear these promises and think of that song, Oh, what a day, glorious day that will be. And we want it now. We don't want to go through the process. We want to relish the point when we will be perfect. But perfection takes time. So we cry out to God, praying for those promises to help us through the present and enjoying your one. Because they are a reminder, they are a refresher, they are a time to build up. An example of this comes from the Christian author and pastor, John Piper. In a devotional, he pens the following words. When I am anxious about some risky new venture or meeting, I battle and believe with one of my most often used promises, Isaiah 41.10. There it reads, Fear not, for I am with you. Be not dismayed, for I am your God. I will strengthen you. I will help you. I will hold you with my righteous right hand. Piper continues, The day I left for three years of Germany, my father called me long distance and gave me this promise on the telephone. For three years, I must have quoted to myself 500 times to get me through periods of tremendous stress. When the motor of my mind is in neutral, the hum of the gears is the sound of Isaiah 41.10. When I am anxious, though he continues, about my ministry being useless and empty, I fight unbelief with the promise of Isaiah 55.11. So shall my word be that goes out from my mouth. It shall not return to me empty, but it shall accomplish that which I purpose, and shall succeed in the thing for which I sent it. When I am anxious about being too weak to do my work, I bow unbelief belief with the promise in 2 Corinthians 12, 9. My grace is sufficient for you, for my power is made perfect in you. When I am anxious about decisions I have to make about the future, I bow unbelief with the promise of Psalm 32 8. I will instruct you and teach you in the way you should go. I will counsel you with my eye upon you. When I am anxious about facing opponents, I bow unbelief with the promise of Romans 8 31. If God is for us, who can be against us? When I'm anxious about the welfare of those I love, I bow unbelief with the promise that if I, being evil, know how to give good things to my children, how much more will the Father who is in heaven give good things to those who ask him? Let that sink in. God is faithful and true. Just like the author and pastor John Piper needed and needs the promise of God daily, so must we. These promises are great gems for us. But sometimes these promises seem to elude us. Why? Because we know they're there. They're, they're in this book. It's full of promises. But what I mean by difficulty. I don't know where to go. I don't know what to cling to. All I can do is cry out, Abba, Father. And that's why I'm grateful that the Lord put in my hearts and mind and women things similar to this. By the promises for you. Is simply a book of scripture <coughs> with themes of letters to follow. Are you struggling with 
Others should tell us the truth or try to cover something up. The last scripture about honesty. <coughs> Another one on integrity. <coughs> Protection. Lord, how will you protect me? Like I said, this is a wonderful book, and it does help people time and time again. Because it reminds us of other promises and helps set us on the right course. However, I do have two concerns. The first is a lot of times we get these and use it to replace this. Yeah. This becomes our Bible. No. This is a reference book to the answer. Amen. Because I'm in a competition with someone, and I want to win, win this race, and I'm thinking in my mind, if God is for me, who can be against me, and I can do all things through Christ who strengthens me? Well, I'm going to win because I believe in Jesus. That's taking it on a lot of context. I need this to find out about those verses, go to it, and see what God has to say completely about that particular promise. And I tell you, this is just a starting point. This is the answer. Find those promises, claim them, but know what they actually say. But I said I had two concerns. The problem in the second concern is this. is how we look at these promises. Not just ones in these books, but all the promises of God. We have a tendency to call upon the promises of God when things go wrong. We say, Lord, here is my problem. What promise will fix it? Then, once we're through that problem, we discard. Shouldn't it be the other way around? We study all the promises of God and apply them in the good and in the bad. Say, Lord, what do you want this world to look like? How can I help make that way? And how do I know you will be helping me in these areas? It's, instead of looking at, at a, through a finite perspective of our problems, let's look at it through the kingdom of God's eyes. And say, this is what God wants. And if we are in that frame of mind, we'll have more of a backing, more of assurance, more of a fruit of the very Spirit. Because we're connecting to God, not just on a moment-by-moment -moment basis, but a daily, intimate relationship. Because we know what He has promised. And are seeking to do all that He desires. And when we are doing all that He seeks to desire, those promises are backed up I'm not saying that he won't come through with his promises if we're only looking in at the problem. But the problem is you are missing out on a bigger picture, a bigger joy, a bigger blessing. Look at the promises of God as something which can be so much more. But why should we even be concerned about promises? It's because our faith is based upon a promise or several promises. Is it because you are a good boy or girl? <laughs> is it because you listen and you read your Bible or you attend church? No, it started out with a promise. Back with Adam and Eve. Saying, I will send my redeemer. 
Then he came to a couple. Advanced in years. The woman, woman's woman, by human standards, was dead. Never had a child, and she was in her 90s. But God came to Abram and Sarah. And that said, in a year, you will have a child. Not only through that, through that child will come the Redeemer of Chuck Thomas. And God made other promises to that family and to the rest of the world that one day that Redeemer came. We got the promise. It's what we are celebrating all next month. Actually, hopefully as Christians, we're celebrating every single day. But it is our faith, our religion is all based upon the promise. What God is doing for us, not what we're doing for God, but what God has said. And he proves himself over and over again. The question is, how do we respond? Are we just going to him when things aren't going our way? Or are we clinging to his promises which bring life to death, from death? Joy from those who are grieving. Prosperity to those who only need man. God wants to do so much for you. Now that does not mean he's going to, if you obey him, fill your bank account. No. But he wants to fill your heart. Make you prosperous there. Make you prosperous in your life. He wants to do so much. But we got to quit thinking that it is about what we do but realizes what God has done. And what he says he will do. And then believe it. And by believing, we're not just talking about yes, and I said not believe it, but do nothing about it. It is saying, Jesus, you promise. You promise things far better than I can imagine. Help me be a child of be a part of the promise and be a promise to others. This is why we seek to God. Not to better ourselves, but to know the Father and help redeem the world. This Sunday is the last Sunday which we're going to be looking at these annual theme of the wonders, the beauty, and mysteries of God. We had set aside all of 2019 to specifically once a month look at a characteristic of God. I think we've done a great job. I hope over the course of the year you've brought more aware of who, the, who God is and fall deeper in love with Him. But I know you're saying, but after yet one more month, the year is not quite over. True. But outside of Calvary, I think there's one more event which we could celebrate, which we will be celebrating, and see the wonder, the beauty, and the mystery of God. It's called the Nativity. And so, as every Christmas, we will be looking at the nativity and using the whole month instead of just one little sermon talking about aspects. We will be looking at the nativity and how it truly brings about the fulfillment of the promise and helps us follow God a little more. One last note before we close. I will say, though, it's going to be a little different this year. I won't be preaching. <laughs> no, you're going to be visited by about five or six different individuals who were there at the nativity, giving their perspective of how this Christ child 
So one, uh, next week I think you're going to be visited by Zachariah. Another week maybe Joseph. One week even Gabriel. And about two or three others. Just telling their story. So it's going to be a little something different. But, throughout all of this, and beyond, think about the beauty of God's promises to you. And how you can be a part of that. Not just a recipient, but a provider. And live in the faith of knowing that what God has said, He will do. Lord, thank you for